different from the male system. Um, the female system is one where the male system is devoted to creating almost unimaginable numbers of gametes. The gamete in the male is just a half nucleus, which isn't very much material, with a motor. The whole idea of a sperm is swim, swim, swim. If you get to a certain region of chemical stimulation, then you start looking around for an egg to fertilize. Literally hundreds of millions of sperm are deposited in each uh, sexual event. The female's body spends an entire cycle, 28 days, maturing one cell and ovulating releasing that cell. That cell is good for about 24 hours. Some do last longer, but uh, as an average, 24 hours of viability if it does not experience a fertilization. Then the cell dies and is resorbed as a part of the woman's body of cleaning out that reproductive tract and preparing it for that next cycle of maturation. So the organs of the system that we looked at were ovaries, uterine tubes, the uterus, and the uterus being the bag where gestation and implantation will occur. The vagina, a passageway between the uh, cervix of the uterus and the external part of the body and the surrounding external genitalia that basically uh, uh, are characteristic of the human female. So we've seen this before because we look at the urinary bladder and the short urethra and this vaginal fold, the labia, enclosing the opening to both the urinary outlet and to the vaginal outlet. Now you'll notice that there is no common urogenital tract in the female. Those are separate at all times. The pathway up the vagina from the external genitalia, the vagina leading to the cervix, this muscular bag. And in, in the female who is not pregnant, this is a fairly compact muscular organ. Basically through the rear of the uterus, there are connections to these uterine tubes and the tube in the pelvic cavity leading to the surface of the ovary. This is a significant increase in the amount of tissue there within the pelvic girdle. The male's genitalia, external genitalia, typically hang outside the body. And within the body, you have the prostate and a few small tubes. Um, the female's uh, uh, organs are considerably larger and more important than their uh, pre-pregnancy state will be what they are expected to accommodate uh, when pregnancy and embryo development, implantation, and gestation occur. That in fact, a large offspring will develop completely within the female's body, uh, accompanied by probably an equal weight of secondary tissues, tissues that are developed specifically to attach and to nourish and to protect the developing embryo. So it's not surprising we see quite a bit of structural support the broad ligament, the uterine tubes are going to run along that broad ligament for support. These are tiny tubes and must remain open, so their support is absolutely necessary. The mesovarium is another membrane which basically holds the ovary in its position. And here's where I think we ended last time. Here is the uh, suspensory ligament. Now from a central position in the pelvic cavity, this suspensory ligament is going to basically be tied up or over here to the pelvis and going to be basically looping down, sort of like a, a, a sling rope. And along that uh, structural support, this is dense regular connective tissue. Here come the ovarian arteries and veins for the major blood supply of all of this tissue. The uh, ovary is seen suspended here uh, with broad ligament attach, I'm sorry, with uh, suspensory ligament attachment and uh, another ligament here stabilizing its position. 
Um, this ovarian surface is where ovulation will release an egg, basically into the body cavity. This tube with its fingers will basically respond to the chemical signals of that and position itself over that or near that uh, releasing egg. The, the egg, if it is uh, correctly and, and immediately uh, taken in, will come down this uterine tube. Now, the egg is a huge cell. It is not capable of its own propulsion like the sperm, so it's not swimming. But there is a positive fluid flow down this direction and a, and a tube that's lined with flagella to keep that moving. Down this uterine tube into the uterus, this incubation bag that is uh, held by uh, ligaments in place. The suspensory ligament across the back, the uh, uh, uterosacral ligament, you can see at its base. And uh, basically the bottom of the uterus uh, looks like a donut with a hole. This external os is the only passageway into the uterus. And this is a, a circular muscle of some considerable strength. Uh, normally it's relaxed and the uterus is open. Uh, sperm will have to swim through this os in order to reach the uterus and swim to the top. Now, this is only half the diagram. At this point, the sperm will make it make a um, directional selection, left or right, um, and will swim toward the ovaries. So this is the upper part of the vagina. This is an area that has folds and uh, uh, mucus uh, membranes uh, so that it is kept moist and, and uh, lubricated. The ovary is shown here with its broad ligament. This is out to the uterine tube and uh, the hilum of its connection to the broad ligament. Now, this is an artistic license that they've taken. They like to draw the different stages of these uh, developing oogonia, uh, the egg pre-cells. You can see them drawn in all sorts of different sizes. But what occurs basically is not a circulation around like this, but a cycle by cycle selection of one cell for maturation. And when it's selected, it will then grow and develop and be released from that location. So here is a large cell. It has begun to swell. And you can see this initial stage where the vacuole begins to develop. This then would be a mature follicle with the egg cell and its attendant cells and a cavity of liquid ready for ovulation. Now, when this is ready, it basically touches and breaches the ovarian wall, and the egg is ejected along with a cylinder of cells around it and an attending fluid. Now, after that ejection, this follicle begins to uh, dry and shrink, becomes what's called the corpus luteum. And this is a further shrunken corpus luteum so that in a mature uh, uh, ovary, you can see where um, previous follicles have matured and released their eggs. Oogenesis is the process that's complementary in, in females to spermiogenesis in males. This is what produces the viable egg, the ovum, and it's a very different story in females. When the female is an embryo inside her mother, as the ovaries develop, meiosis begins within those ovaries before the female's birth. That means that the biochemical determination of the cells in the ovary that can become eggs, can become ova, is determined before the birth of that female, uh, uh, that separation from her mother. Now, they basically get as far as prophase one, and then biochemical signals basically shut them off. Meiosis will resume in that ovary 
only when puberty is reached. That's the physical maturation that begins the cycle. And at that point, that first ovulation, that uh, egg within the female is whatever her age of puberty is, uh, 10 years, 11 years, 12 years old. That egg is 12 years old. It's been suspended biochemically. And it basically is going to divide twice as meiosis usually does but divide unevenly. We saw in males that a single dividing, excuse me, a single dividing uh, cell produced four viable sperm. That's not going to happen in the female. The first division is going to be uneven. So a big cell is going to divide and you're going to get two reduced nuclei one of the products is going to be a big cell, hardly diminished in its size at all. And over here, you're going to get what's called a first polar body. It's basically a nucleus with a membrane, and that's all. Now, prophase one um, is completed. And um, the second division, uh, beginning with prophase two, the polar bodies may divide, they may not, but over here, the primary oocyte is going to divide again and again unevenly. So there is a huge cell retaining most of the membranes, the organelles, the resources, the stored metabolites, the ATP that was present in the primary cell, and then another second division polar body. So you could end up with three polar bodies and one egg. The primary uh, accumulation, the preparation of that egg, uh, shunts all of those resources over into that single cell. Now here's what that allows you to do. When you have a fertilized egg, now you have a diploid egg, it's going to start going through mitosis. The normal thing we see in the body for mitosis is division. You have two smaller uh, cells, which then have to go through a period of growth and then they divide again to get to two cells, four cells, eight cells. What happens in the fertilized egg after you are fertilized? That huge egg that's fertilized now divides in half. And then without growth, those two halves divide into quarters. And basically, there's division after division after division just as fast as you can copy the DNA. So very early on, you get an embryo that's slightly bigger than the fertilized egg but might consist of 32 or 64 uh, cells as the energy in that, in that uh, egg is, uh, fertilized egg is used to create a larger number of cells in the developing embryo. So here's what I just described. The oogonium to the primary oocyte is shown here. In a replication occurs, the primary oocyte, you can see the, here, the, pairing that we called the uh, 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 meiosis one pairing forming tetrads where the homologous chromosomes pair and the first division to produce a secondary oocyte and a first polar body. Now this polar body may not go to meiosis two, we're going to show it that way, but this cell here still growing you can see is the primary oocyte. As we divide the second one here, we have divided that polar body into two more and reduced the chromosome complement to three. The second polar body comes off the second division, and here is the developing egg with a nucleus with three. Now, notice the complement. It's the same as in spermiogenesis. You've reduced the chromosome number to a specific exact half set. And this secondary oocyte is the only one that will develop into the uh, mature ovum. Now, this is also showing fertilization and showing it very badly. The sperm compared to the egg is actually much, much smaller in relationship. So, going back to this idea, looking at the ovary, they've drawn it a little more clearly the primordial follicles with the eggs that are biologically determined and may in fact wait forever 
and never form a mature egg. I think that I've read that uh, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of eggs in the ovary are biochemically separated to that course of development if they're ever activated. But 50 years at 12 cycles per uh, year would be only 600 eggs. So out of those tens to hundreds of thousands, you're really only going to ever use a maximum, let's say, of 600. So from this stage of development, here's a primary follicle with division beginning, the secondary follicle with these gaps remaining, the tertiary follicle, all of these are our stages of development. And then eventually the, the uh, ovulation as this tertiary follicle contacts the outer covering and emits the egg with its corona radiata. Now this is a protective co coating of these accessory cells. As I said, this, this egg can't swim it's much, much too large to propel itself, and it has no mechanism for swimming. And it's going to have to bounce down that uterine tube, propelled by the flow of the fluids. Those fluids are basically going to uh, bounce it off the wall. The, uh, the um, flagella on the lining of the uterine tube are uh, moving the fluid in that direction. So there's some abrasion, there's some movement contacting it. And these outer accessory cells are going to be uh, basically protecting the outer membrane of the egg. Now that moment was captured here in the light microscope. This is a ovary wall, the, the follicle contact point right here. And you can see that the secondary oocyte within the corona radiata here, but you can also see this kind of line around here. Now that's the follicle membrane itself containing a follicular fluid that is uh, maintaining the uh, oocyte within. As I said, once this leaves, what's left behind the empty follicle uh, basically dries up and uh, contracts. The corpus luteum is the immediate product, and with further aging, the corpus albicans. Now, the corpus luteum is going to be, after ovulation, the source of some sex hormones in the female's body. That will be maintained for a period of time, sufficient for the egg to reach the uh, uh, uterine tube some point in its trip to the uterus and it will be replaced by hormones from the uterus itself and the developing accessory tissues if fertilization and implantation is achieved. So this has a kind of a short-term hormonal um, um, duty that is replaced by the organs of the uh, reproductive tract if we get fertilization. So looking here at the, at the um, position of the ovary, it's structural support here, the presence of a rich blood supply is shown here, the uterine artery and vein are branching to provide blood flow, the vaginal artery shown here, and basically to the capillary beds of this actually quite vital and adaptable tissue. We do see a kind of a, this has always mystified me because when I see living processes, it is so often that those living processes are, are absolutely they seem almost perfect in their design. And this seems to me to be a flaw. If ovulating a viable egg is right at the position of the pointer, I would kind of want the egg to go directly into this tube. This looks like a kind of a vacuum cleaner arrangement to me, and that's exactly what it is. So if we're ovulating over here this month, then this tube has to come over to the vicinity and basically suck that egg up. 
If it does not, if the egg uh, is uh, left here in the body space, it simply degrades. If it turns out, if, if sperm are present and it's fertilized, it can actually implant uh, outside this uh, uterine tube and uterine uh, organ and uh, result in an ectopic pregnancy, which is a danger to the mother um, and uh, fatal to the uh, fertilized embryo. So here we have this kind of odd disconnection, but there are so many people, you must believe it works pretty well most of the time. So here we have the course uh, propelled by a, a, a positive fluid flow from the flagella in this uterine tube, pushing it down to the uterine cavity. That trip, basically you have a certain amount of time for that ovum to be fertilized and uh, outside the embryo it does not survive very long. So a superior view, looking here at the anterior side, this is the uterus right here, the broad ligament uh, basically spanning between these suspensory ligaments which have the stronger attachment to the surrounding bone structure. Here behind it, the sigmoid colon and its connection back here to the rectum and anus uh, show you the relative position and relative size of the uterus. Now, in addition to the egg producing organs, the female reproductive system includes mammary glands. The job is to secrete milk um, upon the delivery of a baby. There are two hormonal controls to this. Uh, Prolactin is the hormone that causes milk production. And it fills the ducts of the breast and holds it there. Oxytocin is, the, um, is a, a kind of a dual purpose hormone. It is uh, present in increasing amounts during uh, labor and it intensifies uh, uterine contractions for the movement of the baby out of the body. But oxytocin is also necessary for milk letdown. Um, the mammary glands have uh, fat pads on the uh, mammary region of the body, a nipple on each breast. It contains ducts from the mammary glands to the surface and a roughening of the skin around the um, uh, nipple. Uh, the areola. So this figure shows that structure, fat adds suspending it here uh, with these uh, ligaments, basically uh, interlaced into the muscle fiber of the uh, pectoralis muscle itself, duct and, uh, I'm sorry, duct and lobule arrangements with prolactin filling these and oxytocin allowing for the letdown. The female reproductive system and cycle is one that begins, oddly enough, the same way as in the male. The hypothalamus, in charge of so much of our autonomic function, will regulate the reproductive function and the primary hormone is called GnRH, gonadotropic releasing hormone. It's released in pulses and it basically changes its release pattern during the, uh, over the course of the entire female ovarian cycle. Um, we do see it's responsive to changes in levels of the primary sex hormones, estrogens and progestins. Um, estrogens uh, increase the pulse frequency of GnRH, uh, progestins decrease it. Now, looking at the sex hormones is a kind of an odd trip into uh, stereochemistry, which is what we call drawing a three-dimensional model or a, a space-filling model of a molecule. Because one of the primary things we learn about ourselves, the first thing we are aware of is are we a boy or are we a girl? 
That's the first thing people typically ask about when a new baby comes along. But here we see cholesterol and a derivative of cholesterol, androstenedione, as the precursors of sex hormones. And um, uh, from this cholesterol precursor, we get a molecule that's not very fundamentally changed very much in its ring structure. You've got a 6665. Progesterone is a primary female hormone, as is estradiol. And you'll notice only slight modifications to this cholesterol ring structure in order to produce them. But probably stranger is the difference between those two female hormones and the primary uh, male hormones, testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. So looking at estri estradiol and uh, the testosterone right above it, you'll notice that a primary difference is the lower left hand oxygen is a double bond in testosterone and a OH in uh, estradiol. Now that changes what we call the conjugation. So you'll notice in that, in that lower left hexagon, the presence of double bonds is shifted when you change that OH to a double bond O. But other than that, the molecules are the same. It's a kind of an odd thing that such a minor chemical difference produces this dramatic shift in the elaboration of our organs, in the cycling of our gamete production, in our roles in reproduction. But in fact, largely, I look at these molecules and they look so similar, kind of confounding. A female reproductive system uh, primarily responds to estrogen, which has a number of effects on the female body. Now, these are what I would call secondary sexual effects. Um, effects on the body development that are typical in all females, but not related specifically to reproduction. So presence of estrogen does stimulate bone growth and muscle growth. It maintains all female sexual secondary characteristics. So the typically absence of body hair, the adipose tissue development um, is supported by estrogen production at, starting at puberty. The central nervous system activity, especially in the hypothalamus, um, what's called sexual drive in females is uh, stimulated by pulses of estrogen. The accessory uh, reproductive glands and organs, uh, breast development uh, and so forth are supported by estrogen. And um, it also uh, has an effect on the endometrium uh, in terms of its repair and its growth. You can see here a typical um, view of the phases of the female cycle from 0 to 28 left to right with um, the pulses of GnRH um, shown in green and basically um, accelerating through 0 to uh, ovulation time of 13, 12 days, somewhere there. The peak of the GnRH pulse uh, provides a comp stimulates a complementary peak in follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone shown in blue and red, respectively. Um, the gonadotrophic hormone, the um, hypothalamus, and pituitary action is shown in that top bar. The effect on the follicle of the uh, candidate egg is shown as the egg develops from a very compact size uh, to an enlarging follicle through the first week to 10 days, reaching ovulation. This ovulation is shown at 14 days. And after the departure of the egg, the shrinking and drying of the corpus luteum. Now, the, orva uh, the ovarian hormone levels 
meaning the production of hormones by the ovary is shown to follow in a regular way with estrogens peaking around the time of ovulation in Hibben and progesterone basically following through ovulation, progesterone finding its peak here uh, 14 to 25, uh, 14 to 20 days, and then diminishing uh, toward the end of the cycle. Um, this is showing it in a different way, trying to show the uh, elaboration. It's kind of a busy time in the cycle where menses tears down the thickened endometrium of the uh, uterus what had been prepared as the tissue that would receive the fertilized egg. And then from that thinning, that shedding, a proliferative phase where you're developing more cells and repairing that. And basically, uh, basically, it's sort of like stripping off the old cells and laying down a new fresh layer of cells to begin that uh, potential fertilization cycle again and then uh, finally here the uterine glands begin secreting uh, the uh, uh, materials from the uh, ovarian uh, hormones. The basal body temperature does undergo a variation of about three or four tenths of a degree. At ovulation the uh, temperature increases and remains high through this a uh, late stage uh, secretory phase uh, of the uterine uh, development. Um, this was used quite extensively before more uh, modern uh, methods of birth control. So since the body temperature was the most reliable way, let me go back, of tracking ovulation. So Menses dropped the temperature by three tenths of a degree centigrade, but at ovulation that temperature increased reliably by about three tenths, and um, so that basal body temperature could tell you much more accurately when ovulation occurred. Um, the difficulty is that uh, the predictive value down here. So if a sperm can live two or three, uh, two days, having sex close to this ovulation event might in fact not tell you uh, what you need to know about avoiding conception. Whereas over here, if you get the temperature increase and you figure 14 days, wait till 16 or 17 days, you are fairly safe in terms of that uh, particular egg. Um, so this fluctuation is something that was used uh, reliably in the past and uh, formed the whole uh, basis for a, a method of contraception. Um, sexual function in males and females uh, is an autonomic process, one that cannot be willed and consciously controlled, and uh, coitus or copulation or sexual intercourse or alternate terms uh, for that process where the male and female uh, participate in Congress to introduce semen to the female tract. Fertility in males and females are therefore, because of their very, very different roles, fertility is something that is um, quite uh, uh, different. Males uh, would uh, be relied on their sperm count so given all the hostile reactions and all the death of sperm on the trip to the uh, uterine tube, um, literally hundreds of millions of sperm are required. I guess it, there's no really hard um, statement I can make about how many sperm are needed. However, we must assume that it's a large number. Uh, and I have read I, uh, I have heard it said and read that if 50 sperm reach each ovary uh, from a sexual event, that that's good sperm performance. 
given you started with 200 to 300 million, you can see the overall impact of that uh, male role. The semen has to be correct in its formation. So the buffers, the fructose that is the nutrient, the mucus that is the lubrication, the anticoagulants all have to be there. Behaviorally, the male must undergo an excitation phase, erection, which allows insertion of the penis and ejaculation inside the body. Now for females, fertility is, uh, is basically the result of that complex uh, cycle in the ovary and in the uterus, and they have to work in sequence, um, ovulation, oocyte transfer. Fertilization is ideal if it occurs in the uterine tube and then the fertilized egg begins its division on that trip to the uterus. Um, the environment of the reproductive tract in the female is important because there is variation between females. A uterus that or a vagina that allows the survival of sperm and the movement of sperm. So issues like pH and issues like uh, mucus will be important. Male function has a number of uh, interactions. There's different ways of initiating the sensation that we would call neural reflex uh, that are associated with male um, behaviors that I would call mate identification or mate seeking and they are uh, controlled by the autonomic nervous system, both sympathetic and parasympathetic sides. Arousal uh, basically um, causes a redistribution of blood flow in the male genitalia, which leads to erection. This is accompanied by lubrication, emission, and ejaculation in order to deposit sperm in the appropriate place. Impotence is a term that refers to the inability to maintain an erection uh, to achieve congress and insertion. Female sexual function, parasympathetic stimulation, does cause uh, uh, an, er an engorgement, increased blood flow into the erectile tissues of the female, and uh, secretion of mucus uh, from the uh, cervix and from the vestibule uh, where glands provide the uh, lubrication that allows for insertion. The blood walls, uh, the vaginal walls will fill with blood, it become red in color. Uh, fluid uh, moves from that underlying tissue out to the vaginal surface uh, for lubrication purposes. Now, to kind of complete the organ story, we look at the effects of aging, and we've seen this now in 10 other organ systems. And uh, the female reproductive system is, uh, and the male reproductive system are no exceptions to that. Um, it is as if there's a functional life in each of us for each organ system, and there is a uh, kind of a cell reproduction and cell loss comparison that's useful to make. The pattern of ovulation that began with puberty uh, slows and eventually ceases. Uh, that process of it ceasing is called menopause, and uh, ovulation and menstruation become irregular and cease. 45 to 55 years are a reasonable range uh, on average, although exceptions to that do exist. Uh, with that outward manifestation of the aging of the reproductive system, you'll see a decline of sex hormones, uh, both estrogen and progesterone um, uh, production decrease. Uh, although the GnRH, FSH, and LH increase, um, we do see a shrinkage of tissues with menopause the uterus, the breasts, uh, the epithelium of the urethra and vagina, 
and uh, also a reduction in uh, bone deposition. So uh, if you've been paying attention when you watch TV or read ads, you know that both estrogen therapies and uh, in the male testosterone therapies are frequently referred to and uh, mostly with respect to an aging population. In the male system, these occur more gradually over a longer period of time because there isn't an outward manifestation like uh, the monthly cycle in, uh, that happens in females. There isn't that manifestation in males. The decline of uh, sperm production, the decrease in testosterone is something that is a kind of a background activity. The male climacteric, or what's called andropause, is, uh, are terms used to refer to this decline of reproductive function. Um, so testosterone begins to decline, uh, typically between 50 and 60. Uh, as in the female, follicle-stimulating and luteinizing hormones increase. Uh, sperm production does continue. Uh, with a gradual decrease uh, with as the testosterone in the body declines. You do see a um, decrease in both quantity and quality of sperm uh, that's associated with this aging process. So, <clears throat> in order to expect viable offspring, in order to expect competent reproduction, we do see uh, a number of systems that must function along with the reproductive system for this to be um, the case. So in addition to the reproductive system, the, you've seen the digestive system and adequate nutrition is especially important in the female since she is maintaining her own body and she is building another body starting with a single fertilized egg, a single cell, but basically ending that process uh, with a uh, uh, baby capable of living on its own uh, once it is separated from the mother. Uh, you also see the development of extensive secondary tissues associated with the baby, the placenta, the vascular connections that it contains. Uh, which is a, a, a digestive boost. The endocrine system and hormones for the control, uh, the nervous system, cardiovascular system and urinary system, all very important. Um, the baby is developing its own pump and the pumping of the baby's heart begins early in the pregnancy. But in fact, the urinary system, the respiratory system, the digestive system of the mother are doing the job of blood conditioning, blood supply, blood nourishment, blood maintenance uh, for both of those bodies uh, throughout the pregnancy. So the organ systems have now been reviewed and Chapter 28 has come to an end. <laughs>